to our Lassie's Lecture Series. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, two friends and colleagues. In, and I want to start off by saying that they actually do what we all wish we did, which we all talk about interdisciplinarity, we all talk about mixed methods, we all talk about that they actually do it. And so I commend them for that. So Kata Bailin has a PhD in, uh, in Romantic Languages from the University of Chicago. Uh, she teaches here in the Spanish and Portuguese department. Her most recent book is called In Search of Alternative Biopolitics, in 2015. Uh, Sai, uh, I'm going to mispronounce your last okay, name, I'm sorry. Surnarayan <laughs> <laughs> uh, has a PhD in zoology and uh, works here as, a, as a scientist of biology and society. His most recent book is about bees. It's called the Science and Poli Science Politics and Honeybee Health. Today, they're going to be presenting to us on their most recent work. It's a book that's forthcoming, and it is about how humans and seeds resist genetical manipulation. So let's join me, please, in welcoming Catherine Sai. publicity of genetically engineered uh, organisms promise um, uh, to solve the world from hunger and guarantee sustainable environmental management, the resistance to uh, genetically engineered uh, monocrops has been steadily growing in the lands of Hispanic uh, agriculture. Argentina is the third world, uh, third world largest producer of genetically engineered soy, so-called Roundup Ready soy, which is um, resistant um, to Roundup herbicide, Roundup, which kills everything around it um, except the soy itself. Um, but it has grown uh, the genetically engineered soy the longest in South America. Roundup Ready soy has transformed it landscapes, it has transformed it culture, and it has divided Argentinian <coughs> people. It has also prompted mutation of weeds, turning them to so-called super weeds, which became also resistant to the herbicide Roundup. Um, these weeds, uh, ironically, has been um, become has become allies of humans who are fighting against the genetically engineered uh, uh, monocrops. In Mexico, human alliance with uh, corn, culturally grounded, uh, has uh, become an obstacle to uh, begin commercial planting of genetically engineered maize. So in this context, we are going to be talking about our research in Argentina and Paraguay in 2015 and a short pilot study that we did in the summer of 2016 in Mexico and where we plan to return uh, this summer. We probably won't have much time to uh, mention details of Paraguay just because of the lack of time here. So good afternoon. Uh, I'll say a little bit about what uh, we did in Argentina, uh, we examined human entanglements with uh, genetically engineered soy plants, farmers, scientists, uh, and also the resistant superweeds, mainly uh, a particular species called Palmer amaranth, about which you'll hear about more, uh, as well as alternative crops, focusing again in particular on amaranth, uh, whose varieties are not only uh, including uh, super wheat categories, but also cereal crops. Uh, and so uh, we'll t uh, go conceptually from uh, resistance, interspecies resistance to bioeconomy, uh, to this concept of re-existence coined by Walter Mignolo, <coughs> to mean sets of decolonizing discourses and practices, often inspired by pre-colonial ways of living um, and thinking. 
uh, we want to invert the habitual way of looking at uh, how techno-scientific developments uh, and society interplay with each other. Uh, and we want to ask, uh, instead of asking how people control plants, we want to ask how plants mediate particular socio-cultural and political developments. Since we are not completely convinced by uh, plants having agency and the concept of agency uh, attributing them to non-humans, uh, we substitute uh, and go with the idea of uh, Levi Bryant, uh, who, uh, who thinks of the whole world in terms of gravity and uh, turns everything into objects with varying gravitational forces and trajectories. So for example, uh, there is the idea of bright objects um, which have very strong gravity and turn uh, objects around them or pull objects around them into their satellites, uh, becoming the principle of the traffic around them. And in our story, uh, Roundup Ready soy or ge the genetically engineered soy uh, is a bright object. Uh, we also have rogue objects. Uh, which have surprising trajectories as they appear and disappear unexpectedly uh, and they also subvert uh, sometimes uh, and destabilize the gravitational force uh, and pulling force of bright objects. And in our story, uh, the mutant superweed Amaranth is a rogue object. We're also adopting Donna Haraway's uh, uh, way of emphasizing the particular vantage points from which knowledges are constructed. And we counterpose the vision from above, mediated by uh, satellite science and technologies, uh, to the visions from below that require one to physically be uh, there at a certain place, at a certain time. Uh, and. Uh, uh, facing affected people uh, and plants, bending, touching, smelling, and tasting uh, the soil, so to speak. Building on research in the environmental humanities, uh, science and technology studies, and multi-species ethnographies, where humans and non-humans co-evolve and influence each other, our goal is to open new patterns of understanding the emerging bioeconomy of genetically engineered organisms in the Hispanic world. While we can't match the depth of analysis um, and study within any particular disciplinary framework, um, such as on the Roundup Ready soy economy in Argentina, uh, what we are hoping for, what we're looking for are synergies between different fields and their insights through the bridging concept of interspecies. We discover that struggles surrounding genetically engineered crops can be seen as an exemplar of synergies between culture, politics, and live tissues and science, where mutagenesis affects not only cells and bodies, but also surrounding ecologies and social structures, and even art. Our methodology, then, by necessity, is a transdisciplinary one, uh, by which we mean uh, something that's focused on real-worldly issues uh, and applies concepts and tools from different fields as needed toward building new understandings, uh, focused on a solution, solutions, and uh, better forecasting of future tendencies. So, so. <clears throat> so it has um, always been very tolerant of difficult conditions, but it never competed well with weeds due to its high nutritional value. Uh, as the, the world population grew and demand for the uh, soy increased in the world markets, soy has been chosen to uh, be genetically engineered in Monsanto labs to be resistant to the herbicide uh, Roundup, which, whose main ingredients is glyphosate. Um, we are thinking that it's not uh, an accident that the tool for inserting the gene 
uh, from bacteria to soil is called actually uh, uh, gene gun because as uh, Gustavo Grobo Patel, who is uh, in Argentina known as the king of soil, uh, and is a um, uh, author of a TED talk which, whose fragment I'll show in a moment, uh, he uh, says that uh, it led, this operation led to production of the greatest arm of the 21st century, which is the mastery of photosynthesis. Since um, soil has become um, resistant to glyphosate, glyphosate became its inseparable companion. In fact, its bodyguard. In fact, we could see that soy has been gunned down to become um, a hybrid, soy glyphosate hybrid, um, which um, changed its nature of originally benign plant to malignant and deadly. So this uh, image comes from a sort of sui generis essay by Eduardo Molinari, who is an artist and a writer. And uh, he uh, refers um, what he calls Argentinian transgenic culture to uh, the campaign of the desert, La Campagna del Desierto, where the campaign of the desert of 1870s um, has marginalized and destroyed native people in Argentinian South. In the name of civilization, the campaign of soy has uh, done away with small farmers, and again, it cut into the native reservations. Only during the first 10 years of uh, so-called shohifacion, 160,000 of families have lost their livelihood in Argentina. Uh, and um, some of these people uh, went to the cities and became urban poor, others, um, managed to acquire credits and themselves became, became soy growers or soy workers. <coughs> so um, the first effect of soy taking over Argentinian uh, fields uh, is the change of countryside, transforming it into what local people call the Green Desert. And again, this image comes from Eduardo Molinari's uh, Soy Children, which also um, comments on the transformation of social hierarchy and structure in the countryside and in the cities where we witness the soy inflated real estate boom. Soy has also redefined the idea of failure and success and redefined poverty. So, um, Eduardo, so um, Gustavo Grono Capatel an agronomist and a millionaire um, who um, bases his richness on huge plantations of soy that extends through Argentina and Paraguay. Um, in his TED talk, talks with a huge enthusiasm about the time when it became possible to engineer plants uh, in, um, in the way, design plants in the way that you used to design uh, cars, turning plants into little factories which will be able to produce in their bodies what we used to produce in the factories. But in his discourse, <coughs> these factories are amazing because they are powered by solar energy. And instead of contaminating, they in fact absorb CO2 and produce oxygen. So according to Grobo Kompatel, um, the real revolution is happening right now in the countryside. And where there is space and water, and of course, after human and non-human obstacles are removed, Argentina is now turning into England of the 18th century. So in the video that accompanies, sorry, in the video that accompanies Grobo Copatel's uh, talk, we can see Earth from the satellite, they actually are using satellitarian technology for farming. And very first zooming, you see we are landing on a soy field. And in a second, we'll see a um, um, agronomist looking at an iPad and mapping the terrain of soy production. In the subsequent sequences, you will be seeing how the uh, image comes in and out from screens of 
adverts and uh, phones, confusing the viewer. And this confusion between screen mediated visions of reality and reality itself are very characteristic of the alienation from the reality in which the uh, knowledge of your economy is being produced. So in that, in that very fast zoom that you saw in the beginning of that, of that, uh, of that shot, you could see how the whole life of the planet was being incorporated into the human subjective, uh, productive subjectivity. And it reflected the desire to transform the whole planet in the very same way as the plant of soy has been transformed. And it, 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 it's worth noting that there is only one letter of difference between plant and planet. And in some etymologies, they are in fact uh, connected. So at the end of his talk, uh, Gustavo Grobo-Copatel redefines also poverty. In his opinion, if only people embrace proper technologies, uh, the age of universal well-being is very close. We are going to get rid of the poverty. For that reason, he insists the whole society should be uh, prepared to embrace technology in all its dimensions. And Grovago Patel's ideas are already constitutive of contemporary Argentinian culture, uh, which constructs uh, successful social models in relation to consumption of technology. On huge billboards uh, along the main highway from Buenos Aires outward to the provinces, as we traveled on buses to various parts of, the, uh, of Argentina's countryside, we would often uh, repeatedly see the billboard of a young boy fashionably dressed uh, and surrounded by technological gadgets. Uh, and as he rests his head on a pillow, the gigantic letters read, feel comfortable with technology. And judging by the clothes of the boy and by the interiors uh, in which he's uh, uh, having comfort, the technology is not only envisioned here as a uh, means to success, but also as a mark of class. So yes, in the gravitational field of soy, there are a number of different kinds of violence occurring. There is a the structure of violence of, of different hierarchies that are being produced, which Sai commented upon. There is also some of the direct violence, more in the case of Paraguay, uh, where people are forced to be selling their farmland. But uh, in the Argentinian case, I think the most significant is the slow violence of toxicity. Uh, which uh, shows in long spans of time uh, as symptoms of different uh, illnesses are coming uh, to the surface. And um, uh, Mededa Vira Vasquez is one of the most amazing doctors, scientists, and activists who is fighting against um, the um, Argentinian uh, toxic bioeconomy. And he made a number of studies, one of the recent studies in Monte Maiz, Montemais is one of the little towns which is completely surrounded by transgenic plantations, soy, but also corn, where uh, fumigations are growing every year. So um, he did a health study with a big team of students and collaborators that showed that in this town, uh, the, first the first cause of human death is cancer. Well, in the rest of the country, where in the places which are not surrounded by transgenic plantations, it's only fifth or sixth cause of death. And this is not the only report. Another example uh, that commissioned by the government of Chaco report shows that in Chaco, which is another area uh, which is uh, where corn and soy uh, is uh, very heavily um, fumigated by glyphosate um, in Chaco, and the uh, amount of um, amount of hypothyroidism and um, birth mal malformations is three times larger than in the rest of the country. So paraphrasing Michel Foucault, where there is violence, there is resistance. And as we mentioned in the introduction, uh, this resistance is both human and non-human. And these are interconnected uh, networks of resistance that we focus on. In Levi Bryant's Ontology, bright objects are sometimes destabilized by rogue objects. I'm quoting Bryant now. 
Rogue objects are the new social movements, species, and technologies. They are the revolutionaries." Unquote. So among a growing number of weeds uh, that have mutated and uh, acquired resistance to uh, glyphosate, according to multinational seed and pesticide corporation Bayer, Palmer Amaranth, uh, next to other species of amaranth and a plant called sorgo de Aleppo is one of the most dangerous to soy growers. Um, and it's able to decrease soy yield by over 70%. And you can see here in this picture uh, a field of soy taken over by uh, amaranth. Uh, and once it's taken over, the, the roots, the very deep, long roots of this plant make it uh, uh, really hard to remove by hand, but manually. Uh, and uh, so growers usually resort to adding uh, and multiplying the fumigations of herbicides. Uh, and if that doesn't work, growers are aban abandoning these soy fields uh, and in a way setting the stage for uh, uh, a third nature of sorts in terms of uh, secondary growth forests to come back. Before this uh, third nature comes though, the amount of uh, herbicides and pesticides that are applied uh, in, in an attempt to uh, remove these resistant superweeds uh, is, is just uh, escalating to, to such a degree that nearby communities of humans, of people, uh, are feeling the effects. Uh, and a number of collective actions uh, have arisen and have actually in Argentina been successful uh, at the local municipal level uh, in establishing uh, buffer zones, uh, some, um, some distance between uh, the fumigated plantations of soy and communities of people. And so here we actually see uh, uh, a material synergy between the rising resistance of uh, weeds such as amaranth uh, and the response to those weeds by farmers in connection with the rising resistance of people who start seeing the effects, feeling the effects of those fumigations in their communities. Yeah, as if plants prompted people to resist. So when uh, Senhenta published this publicity of uh, genetically engineered soy, uh, on a map encompassing parts of Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Bolivia as United Republic of Soy, uh, it made evident the neo-colonial discourses of um, multinational and bioeconomy. And as a response to that, activists have recruited Amaranth uh, as a symbolic hero of the resistance. Right, and here is a, um, again, um, Sui Henry's essay investigating journalism novel uh, by Ricardo Serruya, who is a famous uh, uh, environmental journalist recently awarded by his uh, TV program, La Venganza de la Maranta, The Revenge of Amaranth. Um, pamphlets, videos, manifestos are calling on Amaranth uh, nature, evoking also its history as a sacred plant of Aztecs and also the people, peoples who lived under Inca's empire. Um, that was destroyed by Spanish colonizers, um, in part because it was connected to religious rituals, pagan religious rituals, but also because in some publications, apparently, Spaniards were, were aware that Amaranth was what made native people strong uh, due to its um, nutritional values. Right, so these discourses, uh, especially amongst activists, are expressing uh, a vision of an active plant nature that's embedded in a pre-Columbian past, but also in today's popular culture, revealing the biological qualities of amaranth reflected by its name. In Greek, amarantho means unyielding, unwilting, and is devoted to goddess Artemis, who is uh, symbolized by her warrior qualities. The alliance between people resisting the Roundup Ready soy bioeconomy uh, and the superweeds is not only metaphorical, uh, as we mentioned, but also material. And we already mentioned one of the material connections. 
uh, in which uh, not only people are getting fumigated, but also these super weeds that are trying to survive amongst the soy plantations. There is a different register in which the uh, material connection also plays out. Uh, and that register is uh, one in which activists are um, making mud balls filled with amaranth seeds and throwing them into the soy plantations. Uh, they call these uh, mud balls amaranth bombs. And uh, as much as we dislike the militaristic rhetoric here, we have to admit that uh, what's happening in the fields uh, in Argentina between round up pretty soy and amaranth resembles a war-like situation. But this is uh, a vegetal guerrilla war that's inspired certain strategies of human resistance. So among the number of species of amaranth, um, there are also edible ones. Um, on the right side of the screen, you can see amaranthus uh, caudatus, which grows in the Andes, and on the right, amaranthus hypochondriacus, which is dominant in Mexico. <coughs> Uh, they are called farming plants because they can grow where other plants wither. They can take over a month without the rain. And also, they establish uh, malnourished humans' health in a particularly fast way due to very easily to assimilate protein and due to content of lysine, which more tones human immune system. Um, so um, we visited two uh, cooperatives of edible amaranth. Uh, one uh, is called Tatawasa, and it's led by Dalmacio Sandoval. It's in Salta, Argentina. It's just a family cooperative. And a much larger project in uh, Tehuacan, Puebla, center in Tehuacan, Puebla, but which actually uh, coordinates work of over 1,000 families in three states, which is Guerrero, Chiapas, and Oaxaca. Um, called Proyecto Alternativas, related to the make quali, which produces amaranth uh, snacks um, in, uh, um, in Mexico. And both these projects, in a very interesting way, are examples of what we call re-existence. Um, as Sai mentioned in the introduction, re-existence is this concept of Mignolo, where um, decolonizing discourses are formed through a dialogue established with pre-colonial ways of life, strategies of production, and also colonial uh, modes of resistance. So each of these projects deserves uh, its own presentation. But let me just tell you that each of them is focused on alleviation of uh, poverty, um, mm, mm, alleviation of racial tensions in uh, their areas. And each of them uh, owes its success to uh, certain discoveries uh, of the pre-colonial strategies of irrigation and growing uh, of the plants. And the uh, owner of the owner, the leader of this community has made um, uh, very thorough research in uh, codices from Mexican uh, colonial times. So a similar kind of indigenous inspiration for re-existence can be uh, observed in various other points of resistance. Uh, and one that we want to mention and kind of emphasize today uh, is uh, the story of a core group of activists uh, resisting the construction of uh, Monsanto's uh, genetically engineered seed factory that was going to be one of the largest in the world. Uh, and was going to be sited in uh, a, one of the poorest neighborhoods of a city named Cordoba, uh, and this neighborhood, uh, the name is Malvinas Argentinas. Uh, the activists in this, uh, in this neighborhood were very aware of the interspecies alliance with plants. Uh, the inhabitants of the town, in resisting the factory, created an assembly movement uh, called Malvinas Lucha por la Vida, with all the implications that the term has for human health, but also for the planet. On a wall by the Malvinas bus stop, uh, there is a graffiti, shown here, uh, representing the idea of Malvinas fighting for life, depicting human and plant coexistence. Malvinas, mostly a white dormitory town, 
uh, ironically, in a way, reimagines its agricultural landscapes through an idealized vision uh, of uh, a past indigenous life represented by an indigenous woman, uh, connoting freedom, organic purity, and human connection to nature. Another example of the existence also comes from close to Malvinas. Uh, esta fábrica parece que la diseñado el diablo. Uh, this factory seems to be designed by the devil itself, himself, says uh, uh, Medardo Avila Vasquez when we interview him in Cordoba about uh, the factory, which you will see in a moment in, in a little video that we made on the background. Um, this factory was going to be the largest factory of seed in the world, and it was um, placed by uh, Monsanto purposefully in one of the pure, poorest communities uh, of Cordoba, in a distance, um, very short distance of the primary school. The seed was going to be soaked in fepronil. Fepronil is a very toxic substance whose half-life Medardo Avila Vasquez um, thinks is around six years. Um, and the wind, the way the winds go, the wind was going to go from the factory and was going to hit first the um, primary school and then next the town. So the environmental impact report on this factory uh, was not approved by Argentinian institutions, but still Monsanto kept, uh, kept uh, constructing the factory. Just right now you will see, yeah, this is it. This is the, this is the skeleton of the factory. So they kept constructing the factory, and then it was only then when the inhabitants of the town rose up and they planted themselves in front of the trucks and blocked the entrance gates to the factory. And after a few weeks and three battles with police, Monsanto decided that it was not worse for them to persist, and they left. But when they left, they never said that they were leaving for good. So um, a group of youth decided to stay there, camp to make sure that they would not come back, or make sure that they would warn the community if they saw tracks of the workers returning to work. And in the very beginning of the video that I was actually starting, you saw the shacks in which for two years these, uh, these kids were uh, staying. Right? This, is, this is their library, this is their, uh, their camp. For two years and a half without electricity, running water, protected from rain only by these shacks, what did they do? They have, they grew organic gardens. <laughs> they grew organic gardens and they published cartonera books. And in these cartonera books, they, they said that, uh, paraphrasing Giorgio Agamben, in the manifesto, they said, world has changed into a concentration camp uh, where, uh, quote, multinationals are uh, devouring the whole life in order to defecate money. Uh, and uh, it is important for them, according to that manifesto, that the new world be designed precisely at the gate of Monsanto factory. Right? So this organic garden and then this publishing cartonera is emerging at the gate of that skeleton of that factory which is being built. And interestingly, the way they imagine these are drawings made by them, some of them are um, visibly very talented, the way they imagine is the re-existence of the future world if through uh, working on new seeds. <laughs> so while Hispanic countries no doubt share a number of um, cultural values and historical events, there are important differences between their local agricultures or cultures of the field. And we ask how these differences are responsible for the contrasting developments uh, and movements of resistance to genetically engineered crops in the areas we study. While in Argentina, uh, genetically engineered soy has spread to over 50% of all agricultural lands uh, before any uh, significant resistance arose. In Mexico, the battle against GE corn, uh, as Kata mentioned, has mobilized uh, arguably one of the largest and up until now successful resistance uh, movement in Latin America to not allow for the commercial planting of GE corn. And so we are asking if the strength of the opposition uh, against GE uh, corn in Mexico can be attributed to the fact that uh, 
that there is a culture of maze uh, which constitutes a foundation for diverse ethnic cultures in the region which go back uh, over millennia. In other words, can we talk about an interspecies alliance? Right, so this is, this is the, um, an image from uh, Babal Vuh, um, an image to which, uh, that can be referred to Babal Vuh, which tells the story how gods made human beings, and they made it four times, and only the first time when they made it out of God, human beings uh, were successful and successfully functioned. So Mexican activists made this huge mosaic in Socalo, in Central Plaza of Mexico, um, made out of actually corn, uh, in which they, uh, they announced that uh, without corn there is no country, and they stand in this campaign uh, anti-GMO as hijos uh, del maíz, meaning children uh, of corn. Uh, and it's not only, uh, not only activists, there are a number of artists uh, uh, of different kind, which solidarize with the movement. Uh, performance artists, uh, Jesus Rodriguez, Liliana Felipe, uh, painters, uh, Francisco Toledo, um, filmmakers. Alex Rivera was here, and recently, a beautiful movie, Sunu, by Teresa Camus, from which you can see uh, images, alert um, general public to the fact that uh, Mexican meaning of life has been constructed for thousands of years around milpa, the traditional uh, ecosystem of um, Mexican agriculture with, where a number of plants coexist. Um, this is actually an image from an exposition that was organized in Jardin um, Botanico de la UNAM uh, last year where 18 international artists presented their uh, works in defense of uh, Mexican maize. Um, so this is, for example, Damian Ortega representation of Mexican body, but this is the genetic material made out of corn. This is the DNA of Mexico uh, represented as a, as a corn mosaic. And this is a very interesting uh, sculpture called La Bestia, the Beast, which is the name given to the train, the train that uh, takes uh, immigrants from all Central America to the United States and then ironically returns filled with transgenic grain. And between 2010 and 2013, there were six times that it derailed, causing terrible transgenic spills. So the uh, contamination is a uh, big problem there. And it's not only artists uh, and farmers who are resisting uh, genetically engineered maize in Mexico, but uh, there is a, a serious uh, uh, movement of uh, scientists as activists as well. Uh, we, uh, last summer uh, in 2016, we had the good fortune of speaking to Dr. Elena Alvarez Buya, uh, who is one of the foremost uh, plant geneticists in, in Mexico. And uh, she expressed some of the concerns that other scientists have regarding genetically engineered maize, uh, which is uh, one that uh, the ancestor of of maize called Teotzinte happens to also be growing in Mexico. And the fear is that with the uh, introduction of genetically engineered maize, there could be uh, a movement of the genetically engineered traits from uh, GE maize to Teotzinte, which would uh, essentially eliminate the ancestor uh, from which maize came. On the other hand, it, it, there's also a different kind of fear, which is that the GE maize traits, if when they enter, if and when they enter into Teotzinte, uh, could turn Teotzinte itself into a sort of super weed that um, subverts and takes over other varieties of maize. So there are these two uh, you know, uh, mirror images of fear about uh, what could happen with the official introduction of GE maize and hence the resistance to it. Uh, to some degree, uh, the, uh, scientists have already documented the uh, movement of uh, genetically engineered traits from maize across the border in the United States to uh, wilder varieties of indigenous maize in Mexico. So th this is not based on pure fantasy. Uh, 
And uh, in a weird twist, um, in Spain, some of these fears are playing out right now. So it turns out that uh, uh, we don't know how. Teotzinte, from somewhere in Mesoamerica, has landed in Spain uh, in 2014 uh, and is uh, become a super wheat uh, uh, in the genetically engineered corn plantations in various provinces in Spain. Spain, as you may know, is one of the largest producers uh, of GE maize in Europe and, uh, and the Hispanic world. In 2014, uh, invading bodies of Teotzinte uh, were documented uh, in Aragon province, which is one of the uh, largest maize growing provinces in Spain. Uh, and uh, it forced actually some Spanish farmers to abandon uh, their crop and also prompted uh, 